uh, engagement and vibe in zoos. We realized that training, meetups, knowledge transfer is one of the topics that we need to improve and do better. And in order to do that, um, we are expecting from everyone here in the room, all the zoosers, to take initiatives and to come up with ideas to meet up with the relevant content and then to take the lead and actually execute it. Uh, and Meital gave us a great example of doing that and uh, bringing up the right content with the right instructors. So, uh, usually, when it's over, we are rewarding uh, the speaker, but it's going to be pretty late when, when it's going to over this session, so we're going to do it ahead. Free. Okay. Uh, free. So, uh, to make sure you're going to become a loser, so you get a Zeus t-shirt. Thank you very much. And a Zeus flip flop and a hat. So you have a complete set. And thank you very much for your time. And we hope you all enjoy the session. Good evening, everybody. Uh, does everybody also in the back hear me? It's OK. And also in the audio, I just want to make sure because it's Andy there, right? Yes, OK. So I, I can hear you too. Awesome. Uh, first of all, Thank you for inviting me and uh, coming to hear me for about an hour and a bit, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to get to know before I start talking, uh, like the population of people. How many are engineers, software engineers in general? Okay, most. Uh, people from product maybe? QA or others? Others, okay. <laughs> Non-tech people. The ones that are, okay, awesome. Um, I, I want to focus because really I want to kind of create that as a this like meeting as a conversation for you to be able to like speak about cybersecurity in general. This will be like one of the the main goals, and afterwards to talk about uh, about technology gen in general, uh, cloud technologies and Kubernetes and all of the surrounding infrastructure there. Uh, so feel free to be Israeli, interrupt and ask questions during the session, okay? Uh, I think it will be beneficial for all sides. And again, if I blurb something, some like three letter abbreviations that you don't know, again, stop me. It's really okay, I will try to explain as, uh, as best as possible. Uh, if I know something, if I don't know something, I will lie bluntly with high confidence. So <laughs> that will happen also. Um, we'll start with the first talk. Uh, it will be focused mostly about how hackers actually see companies and uh, about the life cycle in general of cybersecurity in practice. Okay, so again, hackers versus company, because a lot of times they want to target a lot of like valuable assets that they want to maybe obtain or maybe expose. It really depends on the method and why, what's the real intention of the hacker. Because a lot of times, hackers do things for fame, okay, without no need for actual like financial gain. They want to know that they Wanted to do something, and they can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you stopped sharing the, the presentation. Really? <laughs> okay. Let's check. Maybe because I am presenting via <coughs> this. Okay. Makes sense. I don't know why. Awesome. So, in general. Uh, every cybersecurity talk must start with a hoodie, okay? <laughs> so once we got off that that off the table, we can begin. Uh, also, please welcome Elad, Hi. our head of security research at Panrays. <laughs> so he's the dude here. Can can great great timing, great timing. So uh, I'll start with a short presentation about myself. Um, as my tell and uh, also introduced, my name is Demi Benari. I'm the co-founder and VP R&D of Panrays. Uh, we're a cybersecurity company. Surprise, surprise. Um, in my um, previous roles and in the past, I was eight years in the Israeli Air Force. There I actually developed a missile defense system. I was a, a software engineer, team leader, and then a senior engineer. And when I left the military, I started working at a company called Windward. Uh, basically what I did with missiles in the Air Force, I did with ships when I left the military. And uh, we handled uh, maritime analytics. Have any of, of you heard about Windward? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, so mostly there, I uh, in the military, I handled near real-time distributed systems, on-prem deployments, mostly because it's the military. Uh, and when I uh, 
started working at Windward, I started a shift to the cloud, to AWS, and started working with cloud service providers with big data distributed systems. You might know that, like Apache Spark, Sandra, working a lot with S3 and a lot of like distributed databases. And in the past, I think like five years, I'm also doing a lot of developer communities. Uh, so I founded two developer communities here in Israel. One of them is called Big Things, if any of you have heard of it or been at any of the meetups. Uh, we're focused in big data, data science, and DevOps. And the other community that I founded is uh, GDG Cloud. Have any of you heard about the GDG in general, Google Developer Groups? It's not something of Google, but Google is really supporting of communities. And basically, they are creating uh, support to communities in the world of tech. And mostly, it's location focused. So it will be like GDG Tel Aviv, GDG Arcelia, GDG Be'er Sheva, or New York, San Francisco, etc. So because they thought that cloud is really important, that they want to move forward uh, all of the cloud technologies, etc., they had created conceptual GDGs also, like focused in cloud. So uh, we formed GDG Cloud Tel Aviv, talking about cloud technologies, cloud native, serverless, and all of the new buzzwords coming to the industry today. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert, which basically means that Google certified me that I talk a lot. So if you don't stop me, I just can continue on talking. And this is, in general, my background, uh, software engineering, back end, front end, whatever. If you have any questions, just uh, barge in and ask Ellie really ask. Um, some important things before we begin the, this talk. What I'm not, a security expert, OK? And what you won't be after this talk is security experts also. Uh, you will be after this talk happier people because I've stopped talking. Uh, and you will know at least how to search things, uh, know the basic terms of the world of cybersecurity in general, and uh, again, the combination of cloud and cloud technologies, and you will know the answer to, life, uh, to, to the question of, excuse me, what's the meaning of life? Um, cybersecurity. Okay, can anyone tell me what cybersecurity is or what cyber is in general? It's a buzzword that everybody are using, and it's like something obscure out in the world, right? So think of it that everything started from digital presence, okay? Something that is uh, in the kubernetic world. And in general, when we're talking about cybersecurity, okay, we want to have all of our services and all of our outfacing things and internal systems and interconnected systems secure, okay? But a lot of times, as you can see here, uh, things talk about uh, physical cybersecurity also, okay? Because like even when you're talking about uh, the entrance cards that you have to, to all of the offices, this is something connected digitally but also connected to the physical world, okay? Elad would give you an example of actually like trying to <coughs> hack places which are like hermetical. You can't get in there, okay? But you always... I just got into the building of that into here by the woman that the floor. <laughs> <laughs> was here because I wanted to but I can't go anywhere. It's, it's fun for him, okay? I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good exercise, but uh, usually what I do to get into places, I give a drone up in the air, like this is like... Elad, you need to stand up because like Andy can't hear you, I think. So usually what I do, I bring a drone, and uh, if you have a balcony here, I don't know if you have, Probably not on the 61st floor. Usually when people go to smoke, I don't think that if there's USB, it's somebody throw it from the floor, ground floor to the balcony. So go with drone, drop the USB, one goes, somebody goes to smoke, see USB, get it into the computer. And you would be surprised how many people, like uh, curious people, stick USB sticks to their own computers because they can maybe like, oh, somebody left a USB stick, maybe I can reuse that. Sounds okay. smart, right? Yeah. What? <laughs> okay. okay, so we kind of talked about like security and a lot of fails that we have in the world of cybersecurity. But let's like, try to define that as a process, okay? Because first of all, we're talking about technological things, right? Interconnected computers, we're connecting to Wi-Fi, this, like our phone, which is practically a computer. Um, and all of this kind of technology is something that we need to be aware of. This is the first thing. But of course, security is doing actions, okay? A lot of times, preventive actions, but on the ongoing basis, we also need to like have things that we need to act upon 
to be a part of the cybersecurity infrastructure, okay? And it, again, this is the entrance cards, maybe you have like uh, RSA tokens that you're putting in your computer, two-factor authentication with the phones, process something actionable that we need to do to protect ourselves in the world of cybersecurity. And of course, process, something that most people and employees hate, okay? When I need authorization, when I need from somebody, I, I'm kind of registering to the platform and I need to go over some kind of form to notify all of the people in the organization that, hey, hey I'm a new employee, I need some like uh, credentials to internal systems. I need to kind of verify and sign on a computer basically to have that, to have that listed somewhere that this is my computer, this is Demi's computer. And combining all of this, is basically creating some kind of infrastructure and surrounding of security in our organization, which might be three people and 3,000 people. Okay, it really varies between different companies. And again, you have some companies that have different departments that work like different companies. Okay, so this also might happen. Okay, so we said we can invest a lot with security. How many people have been here since Zeus like, was founded? Nobody. Really? Wow. No founders here also, right? No, one is abroad and the other one is abroad. Okay, I see. So why am I saying that? Because a lot of times it really depends on the size of your company and the um, measurements that you might be able to actually pull out and resources that you have to create some kind of infrastructure that has a secure manner here. Okay, so you always have that conflict between resources that the organization has and the security that you can actually create. And of course, threat, okay? A company of three people that nobody knows has like maybe, okay, I won't say like 100%, less threat of being attacked than a company of 3,000 people that has a large presence in the web, right? Make sense? Okay, but again, for a company of 3,000 people to actually secure itself really well, you need to put in a lot of resources for that. Resources might be human time, right? It might be money to buy security products, and it might be effort and like process that you need to put in place for everybody to manage that. Eventually, you need to some like somebody actually in charge of cybersecurity. For three people, a lot of times you don't have a CISO, a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. Okay. And this is something really, really important, and there is always a tension at the company when you actually need every function like that, okay? Because a lot of times, how many people are, are from the world of DevOps and IT? Okay, usually the task of cybersecurity falls upon you guys, okay? Uh, right now a customer gives me some kind of like, uh, I don't know, um, requirement or feature request to put in multi-factor authentication. Who is the lucky guy that needs to do that? The developers in the beginning but eventually you need some kind of infrastructure to create identities right and a lot of times we're using that with the cloud of course uh, you're on Amazon or Google Amazon. Amazon okay so I am roles you're starting like to create all of the roles for all the employees services etc so of course other functions like uh, um, any product managers here no product managers okay <laughs> So a lot of times the requirement even will start with them and try to incorporate some entities in the in the company. Uh, CFO here, the guy that actually approves money, you're always there also, okay? So again, resources, security, everybody are intercombined. And who are the people that are most annoyed out of security? You guys, okay, why? Because you need authentication. You need a lot of times to create some kind of process. You need to maybe like apply, um, apply to some kind of like regulations that you have. How many of you have heard of the GDPR? That curse, oh yeah, nice, okay. So because of that, you're gaining a lot of like overhead in the matter of process and everything is resources. Okay, let's do an asset experiment. Um, how many people here can say what's the most confidential thing at Zeus? Credit card, right? Okay, this is like PII data, like people providing a credit card uh, information, and if it gets exposed, it's a big no-no, right? Awesome. Okay, but you might have some things that you can't afford to lose, okay? 
what kind of data you might have that it's not really that important if somebody actually steals that or not. You might not. Yeah. Okay, but the details. the details. Okay, partially because a lot of times because of the GDPR and all the data privacy it's rules, safe this for is us important. To answer all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that a lot of times maybe like your ten base orders are not that important probably, right? Personal ones. Because if somebody steals that, maybe they can like poison you or something like that, right? But it might be important, but you don't care about losing that because this is something that will get renewed or like maybe, uh, you know the latest uh, Facebook breach? Have you heard of it? Yeah. With authentication tokens? Mm -hmm. Okay. It wasn't that like good that they were breached because somebody actually stole the, these credentials. <laughs> but the, what? They, they just replaced it. The yeah. They, they kind of expired the tokens and made it irrelevant once they knew that actually somebody had hacked them, right? So it, it is important, but you can't afford to lose that and if you try to remediate that afterwards. Okay, what's irreplaceable? DevOps guys, okay? Uh, how do you automate your infrastructure? What, five? No, no, no. How do you automate all of your infrastructure? <laughs> awesome. Automation. Ansible. Maybe you're using um, Terraform to kind of create like immutable infrastructure, etc. right? One way of actually compromising a company might be destroying the servers, right? Okay. It's not something that the data is resided at, but it's something that is serving uh, information for your clients, right? But if with a click of a button, basically you can r uh, ramp up your whole infrastructure without no hustle. Is this important that somebody actually ruins your server? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, it really depends on your SLA that you have to give to your customers. So if something is replaceable, then it's a problem. But if I can like recover the data, everything might be really okay, right? How many of you have uh, heard of ransomware? Enough people, right? Somebody comes, encrypts your data, and tries like to, to, to get money from you for them to get to decrypt that, right? But if you have backups to your data, then basically you're safe, right? As long as he doesn't know how to actually decrypt the data. Okay, and again, steal everything, etc. So uh, you need always to think what can cause the most damage to your day-to-day -day operations and to your customers, of course. And of course, Reputational damage, okay? Again, uh, you're probably PCI compliant, okay? What happens if you get breached and all of your financial data is out there? This is bad, okay? Bad for a financial company. Uh, but also with for it, security companies. Of course. It's the end of the company. Basically, it's you had one job, okay? <laughs> yeah. So you need to think, you need to take that into account also in the matter of reputation, but a lot of times, reputation can be covered by insurance, right? Uh, have you heard of Equifax, the, the credit scoring company that got breached? 146 million social security numbers were stolen. The company is still there, yeah. okay? I heard that uh, what's the name of the company that uh, for cheating? Uh, Which? Ashley Madison. Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. They actually triple their sales after the branch, right? Why? But this is like uh, the opposite of actually creating some kind of reputation for you. <laughs> <laughs> they had different kind of problems afterwards, but yeah, maybe the income was uh, ramped up there. So these are the assets that we're trying to handle. Assets might not be like servers or databases. This really like means that we need to take into account which data we are like taking as our most valuable assets and try to create some kind of separation in that as like IT people, okay, as software engineers to kind of like create, um, how can I say, mm, like safe silos, okay, of information, which we can consolidate the information and serve data accordingly. And this means we need to create our code accordingly to create an, a secure architecture. But again, for that, we need to, to know how to divide our data to what's important and what's not. Because like to create this SLA of being really, really secure can be really costly and can like take from us a lot of resources as a company. 
Okay, so examples for data assets. You can read them, okay? Like photos, credit card details, bank accounts, uh, a lot of PII information, uh, account information that we have on our own aliases, right? Because maybe I have my own work email that is super secure, but with the same computer, I'm, I'm logging in with my Facebook, National Medicine account, like you said, or whatever, and I can get compromised from different areas, right? Because a hacker doesn't look at me as Demi, the employee of Panorix. He looks at me as Demi, as the entity, okay? And again, you have Chinese phones, right? What do you think you have here? Okay, so because of that, you have a lot of like different kinds of uh, like security measurements that you can handle, okay? Maybe like uh, keychains, password keychains, okay? Or like multi-factor authentication that you can create an overlay over your phone. And you know, like you heard the, the latest um, hack that was made to all Amazon and all of the like big retailers via the mm -hmm. chips that the Chinese had put in them. Yeah, it's real. It's real. What? It's real because they said that they did it to the iPhone. I wouldn't be surprised if it's real, okay? Because again, you can't actually notice that. And they do that. Okay, there are a lot of government agencies that I won't mention that do that. Espionage. But again, probably they won't target me, okay? But they can if they want. So we need to take a lot of like measurements to make their life harder. Because it's always like a cat and mouse struggle. Okay, so again, we have the primary email that we're using, but I will ask that question. How many of you have more than three email accounts? What? More than three. Okay. Exactly. One for spam, one for a different kind of spam, one that I don't want to be correlated with me, and my main thing, okay? But how many of you are using your main primary uh, email account for your bank account? Okay, why not separate that also? Have you thought of that? And create a more secure one it's because endless. you can always divide and divide and divide. Totally agree. To you remember your going back, somewhere. going back to convenience in front of security. Okay, and a lot of times I like gave up. Google knows everything about me. Okay, I don't have any privacy. I know that. But again, it's super convenient for me. I know like. When I want to go to a restaurant and I'm walking around, I just open up Google Maps. What do you think they're doing? They're tracking us. Okay, they have like all of our like walking history in life. Okay, but again, we have all of these like super confidential assets also, secret files, right? Um, you're using Vault? Yeah. For example, okay, something to source for, um, information, password information, financial records, somebody using Bitcoin. Okay, and a lot of your user data is important also because again, once you know who is your user data, you know who are your suppliers, you know all of your business connections, and guess what? People will try to hack you through your suppliers also. Okay, because why? Because maybe you put in as many like security measurements that you want, secure API, etc., but your third party were hacked, and basically they can hop to you guys through them. And we'll talk about that uh, in the future. Uh, yeah, some words. We have a lot of words like these. Okay, so some attacker buzz, buzzwords that we want to mention. Malware, okay? Uh, basically, we as human beings are walking malware. But we have digital malware also. Microviruses, uh, stealth viruses, all sorts of viruses that we have on our endpoints, okay? Uh, you know, the antiviruses are the remediation for that, but it's not the... If you have an antivirus, then basically you're secure. You remember, like th this whole this whole world had gone a uh, really long time ago. Uh, remote access that somebody can actually gain to your own devices. Uh, firmware rootkits, okay? Again, like we said, with chips, something that you can't actually like notice at all in digital presence that we have uh, on our infrastructure, right? And you might have some alerting on that also. Worms, keyloggers, a lot of like things that Alad can tell you about remotely uh, trying to like get your password through the Bluetooth keyboard that you have two offices uh, like away from you okay all these kind of weird methods that if somebody actually targets you then I won't say it's a lost cause but it will be really really hard to actually defend yourself uh, Trojan horses drive-by attacks that you can like visit a website 
uh, download some kind of malware without you knowing, and of course they do whatever they want afterwards in your computer, and et cetera, et cetera, ransomware that somebody can encrypt your computer, and more and more methods. Phishing, okay? Uh, I like to define ourselves uh, as people, as the stupid factor in the world of cybersecurity, because this is like the easiest way for hackers to gain access to all of our internal things. Okay, mm -hmm. we can protect ourselves with them. as many firewalls as you want, as many security measurements, but eventually a phishing email that will get to us, most people will probably click that. Okay, but it's not only emails. And um, there was a company that actually did some kind of experiment. They sent them a link of, I think it was 60% off on Tenbis, okay, uh, on a certain day on specific uh, restaurants from Tenbis. Okay, uh, what's the click rate? What do you think 100%. was <laughs> totally right? One hundred percent of people actually clicked. Okay, this is amazing. People will sell them out of percentage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will send Tamir Karamel a message. Basically, he will be really, really satisfied. Okay, so basically, you have different kinds of ways to actually do phishing. Okay, the regular phishing is email. It's easy. But what about phishing, video phishing? Okay, you have. YouTube videos that are like being streamed, right? And a lot of times you have advertisements there. And oops, I clicked some kind of link that popped up there. Okay, it might be Vimeo or a different kind of like video streaming uh, framework. But again, I clicked that, right? And schmishing or SMS phishing. Uh, for example, uh, how many of you have gotten an SMS which says like bit.ly something, blah, blah, blah. Please click that for like something. I don't know, whatever. <coughs> Okay. Okay. And for example, you have a lot of like spam SMSs, right? And what the link says, press this to unsubscribe, bit.ly, blah, blah. How many people do you think that will actually click that? Probably 100% again. Okay. So again, only no, my mother would 100% would like click that. Okay. Why? Because again, it's something that leads me for a good thing, right? And again, because of the phone, we are connected to our like um, bank account here, to all of our messaging, and it's really, really easy to download malware this way. And you won't even notice that, okay? And most of us don't have antiviruses on the phone or any mitigation actions, right? Although it's a computer. We said it's the same. Okay. So, after talking about all the frightening things in cybersecurity, let's talk about identities. And uh, what's privacy, anonymity, and pseudonymity? Okay, so let's start off with privacy. What is privacy? Something that I don't have. But again, let's try to define this term. The right to keep secrets. The right to keep secrets. Keeping something secret is, is the right point there. Okay, so it is basically answering the what I'm doing question. Okay, I'm trying to hide what I'm doing, right? And this is a lot like when we let's take the digital form of privacy, okay? How do I protect my privacy on the web? Clear history, okay, interesting. Incognito, no. Incognito is not exactly like privacy. SSL. SSL, exactly. Encryption, encryption at least by transit, right? Okay, some kind of like direct channel that I'm creating between me and somebody, and we're encrypting all of the data that is passed there. And again, hopefully nobody knows what I'm doing, okay? But they know that somebody from a specific IP address and a port is creating some kind of connection uh, via HTTP maybe, because this is the protocol that we're talking, right? Awesome, so comparing privacy to anonymity. What is anonymity? Who is doing what, okay? Or at least like hiding who is doing what. And do you know any anonymity method, methods, like you said, like you mentioned? Yeah. Incognito. Incognito is... <laughs> Anonymous, okay. Proxy, <laughs> VPN. It is anonymous, okay. Uh, but skinny, I'm just, uh, no, no. We'll, we'll get to pseudo anonymous. Tor browser. Tor browser, okay. How many of you have know the Tor network? Nice. Okay, great. Okay. Why was Tor created? University is something. <laughs> okay. Uh, you are correct. It's created from something academic, and basically they created a platform that people can hide their identity. And why? 
it didn't start off from like um, smuggling drugs or something, okay? It got to that eventually, but it started off from creating some kind of creative platform, um, protective platform, I'm sorry, uh, for a uh, press or the press entities at any companies that, uh, at the countries that uh, try to like control them, okay? So by that, they can create some kind of anonymity of not being killed because they said something about the ruler. But again, they created a tool and people can use tools in different manners. Okay, so once we've answered the what I'm doing and who is doing, what's pseudo-anonymity? No, it kind of like combines both, actually, okay? Why? I know that somebody do, is doing something, okay? But I don't, don't know who that is. So it's an alias, okay? So I'm kind of creating some kind of alias maybe on LinkedIn, which is not Demi, which would be, I don't know, Dave, okay? And Dave is behaving in some kind of manner, but again, he is uh, going through some kind of like anonymity network. And Dave is surfing via VPN or some kind of proxy, okay? Something stupid that you can do, okay, is basically break the thing of anonymity with pseudo anonymity by going through Tor and connecting with my own personal Facebook account. Because I went through some kind of secure measurement, right? But again, I created some kind of login with my own credentials. So I kind of broke the anonymity when I tried to go through Tor. And because of that, Tor actually has onion uh, addresses that are correlated to Facebook, which you can basically do both at the specific uh, entity, okay? So we've created some kind of like terms, basic terms of talking about privacy, anonymity, and pseudonymity. And what's the difference between authentication and authorization? Authentication is who is. Mm -hmm. Authorization, if it has the right. Right. What is not what you can do. Exactly, exactly. So authentication is basically seeing if Demi is Demi when I'm trying to kind of create some kind of connection a lot of times, right? Or a lot of times, when not creating the connection, by co the conversation itself, for every, um, I don't know, like uh, on and forth with some kind of customer, I'm creating some kind of authentication every time. Why? Because I want to expire the tokens or et cetera. I, I want to create some kind of mechanism that I can like change that on the go without actually like having to authenticate only once and that's it, I'm logged in for eternity. Authorization, like you mentioned, is basically what I'm allowed to do. So a lot of times we create two phases in the world of authentication of entities. Once first I log in, I kind of identify myself through maybe third parties, you know, like Okta or different kinds of like uh, single sign-ons. And after I've got that, my own internal system has some kind of like policy management, right? what kind of components I can actually access as Demi, as a service, or whatever, right? Uh, and of course, you have that both in server-side and client-side also. Uh, what kind of front-end you're using? Or React. React. Yeah. React, okay. So components, basically even after you get some kind of authentication afterwards, in the authorization phase, you can choose which components are actually returned back to the client. And not only leave that to like server-side uh, authorization afterwards. Okay, I see cyber risks everywhere. Okay, after we frightened you about like all of the attack methods possible, etc. Let's talk about circles, because people like circles. Um, we have assets, security, threats, and adversaries. Okay, and these are all the cycles basically that we need to kind of like identify in our own organization. We've talked about files, anonymity, pseudonymity, content, privacy, identity. These are all assets of our company, our company or maybe even them. Afterwards, we have different kind of like security measurements and uh, leverages that we can actually implement in our organization. Tor, VPN, encryption, two-factor, multi-factor authentication, patching our servers, which is really important. HTTP filters, SSL, you know, like encrypting everything in our transit, uh, again, a lot of companies come to the um, kind of notion. I want to create some kind of secure connection to all of my clients. But what happens when you go inside? Between your servers, you have SSL also? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe between the important servers or not? Because this is, again, this is time consuming, right? Every encryption takes time. 
And if I need to keep up an SLA of nanoseconds, maybe this is not important enough because the data is volatile. I don't know. But again, it really depends. You need to identify that and create the relevant measurements to protect yourself. And of course, like SSH connections and HTTPS, really, really important. And on top of that, of course, we have all of the type of, types of threats that we're trying to create protection from, right? Like vision, phishing, spying, okay? Spyware, malware, viruses, some kind of mass surveillance, okay? Countries, nationwide countries that want to kind of be on all of the ISPs, uh, internet service providers, and know who's doing what, okay? And of course, adware, like we said, we're, how many of you have ad blockers? Really? You don't have ad blockers? Ad blockers. On your browser, ad blockers. But who of you who doesn't have ad blockers, a lot of times malware can come through ads, right? I can target you guys as a malicious entity, and I can give you a link to something that I know, again, like 100% discount in Tenbis, and probably you will click that to find out what's happening and you won't know what's going on. I can give a unique example. I used to work for UPG with like an antivirus app in the the world. And one of the competitors, for example, one of the competitors of the UPG was like an antivirus app. And it's free. So there's advertising a component inside the app. So you open an antivirus app and there's advertisement. So hackers advertise malware through the advertising component of uh, the antivirus. <laughs> so you check it out, you see here, finally to info about the virus, you think about it, hey, it's McAfee, you press on the advertisement inside the antivirus app, which is not related to the app, and you get infected. <laughs> and you think, everything is credible, right? I'm inside my app. And of course, on top of that, you have adversaries. Okay, these are the entities that want to exploit all of these threats or possible like things that I can that I can take, okay? Spies, nation states, hackers, crackers, hacker groups, criminals, okay? But a lot of times these are the most stupid things. Like for example, a 12 year old that found an exploit on Google and presses run, okay? And that's it, that's all it takes. Basically to try to exploit something because everything is automatic today. And again, like, we, like you saw here, colleagues, ex-partners, okay? Some malicious entities that were in your company and basically if you haven't expired their own credentials, they can hurt you. Why? Because people are people. Okay, so this is also something important. Again, sorry IT people. We need to kind of like take care of that and try to get to know at least what are our assets and what do we have and what do we need to expire once an employee leaves. Okay, process again like we said. So <clears throat> defense in depth. So we have a lot of threats and we have some steps on the way of cybersecurity that we can take in account basically to prevent things and to try to remediate also, right? So we have the prevention phase. After we can't actually prevent something, we try to detect that at least in our own network. And once we've detected that, if we can't remediate and recover, it will be a problem, right? So we need to take this whole life cycle to basically be of some kind of awareness of our own cybersecurity posture. Let's go more into detail, okay? And prevention, defense, and also response and recovery. So we have a lot of like things that we can do to do things with our own security posture. We have the known threats, all of the things that we can take into account that basically will happen. So we have like blacklists of IPs, right? That you can block traffic from someplace. And not only in the world of cybersecurity, there are a lot of American companies that because of the GDPR, because they wanted to comply, they basically blocked all the traffic from Europe. Okay? Does that work, in your opinion? No. No. Why? Because if an EU citizen accesses the information from the United States to Europe, he is also under the GDPR protection and fucked. Yes. So, uh, reputation system, threat intelligence that you can collect on your organization, uh, intrusion prevention, some kind of like virtual keyboards, content filtering, disk encryption if somebody actually steals your physical hardware or whatever you're trying to think about. But a lot of times you have all of the unknown threats, right? How is somebody looking at you from the outside? I will show some examples, I think, yeah, I think in this presentation. Um, okay, so you have a lot of things that you can actually like 
prevent that also, right? You can create uh, sandboxes, isolated components to all of your information, uh, I don't know, access control listing, restriction policies, etc. Once we get to the defense, uh, basically we get to all of the regular tools that you know. Antiviruses, uh, you're using web application firewall, Cloudflare maybe, or like Imperva, something like that. Okay, awesome. A lot of vulnerability scanning that you can do in your internal network also to try to understand at least what are the possible exploitation methods that you can be uh, vulnerable to. Uh, EDR technology, anti-spam, and also for the unknown threats, all of the cool AI machine learning tools that they can, can sell you in the world of cybersecurity, behavior analysis, anomaly detection, uh, biological binary analysis of some kind of, I don't know, like a lot of things, a lot of buzzwords in the world of cybersecurity. And of course, when you respond to things, we get to the bare bones and basics. We have like automated responses and remediation, a lot of recovery, backup, snapshots, uh, DR, like disaster recovery um, mechanisms that you might have also in duplication of the data, right? So a lot of times once you get something corrupted, basically you can like fall over to the like backup location and try to give the SLA to your customers as usual. Okay, cyber, 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 because we need some kind of like uh, stop here. What are the top three things you need to do to stay safe online, in your opinion? Not going online, right. Uh, I always say that basically I need to go to Hawaii and start, start raising shit. Mm -hmm. Okay? And basically this will be like the safest way to go. But it doesn't work that way. Uh, but yes, after we went online, how can we actually secure ourselves? We mentioned a lot of like methods, right? Antiviruses. Firewalls. What are the firewalls? What are the most important things that will give you credibility? Let's say you had endless money. Physical security, yeah. having bodyguards. Okay, so surprisingly, the three top things are one of the most frustrating things and hardest things in software engineering that basically if we had that, no security problems were introduced in the world, right? Updated systems. How many of your software components are the most up-to-date today? Zero. Zero. Yeah, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. What, what, what? Uh, I think that uh, for the technology itself, because of Node and React, it's uh, a lot more uh, up to date than C Sharp or stuff like that. Awesome. So basically, you're saying we're with Node, right? And because of our like uh, super uh, high tech conceptual CI CD uh, mechanism that we've created, everything is being updated daily, right? Only on the code, code part. I don't know about the uh, I'm talking about everything. So I will ask. Guide which version are Mac and DC yeah, that's the yeah, or, or the servers themselves. How many times a day you're updating the servers? Patching. <laughs> but everything, yeah, Amazon is securing everything, right? You will all agree, for, first of all, you will all agree that it's hard, right? Maybe even your authentication and SSO and all of these kind of things. When you kind of decide you want to upgrade something, usually it takes about a couple of months until you deploy that update. Not talking about like node versions, okay? <laughs> and, and, and think of it that, again, you're a startup, you're a startup company, guys. <laughs> think of it of how hard it is for Oracle, for example, to upgrade something, okay? And we see that from the outside. And because of that, I'm saying that this is the biggest frustration. But if we had that, all of the security experts say that hacking would be practically impossible. And using two-factor authentication. Again, why? The identity part of hackers trying to get privileged accounts, this is this. If they can't actually log in and you make their, hard, uh, their life much harder, basically they can't do anything with that. And of course, passwords, okay? I won't ask this question because, <coughs> because this is recorded. 
most people admit that they have the, the same password for like 90% of their services, okay? And when they change something, like change the password, they try to change that accordingly to, with all of the services because they don't want to forget. Okay, so using a password manager is a good thing. This is another kind of risk. Why? Yes. yes. So basically, if somebody steals that, you're oh, practically you screwed. <laughs> this is bad. This is really, really bad. Okay. So, but really, these are like real life practices that you, you can understand, especially as engineers and people that are using technology, that once we have these kind, kind of mitigation actions, we will be much more, much safer than other people, right? Okay, so how do I do it? at least like threat modeling as a software engineer even? Okay, I don't need to be a security expert. Okay, we're designing our code, we're talking about performance, we're talking about a lot of things, we're talking about security also when we're designing our code. So how do we do that? And what is threat model modeling in general? It's structured security basis analysis. Okay, so I need to I kind of understand my infrastructure. I need to understand what I'm trying to implement and then try to think about all the security risks that I'm introducing to my new system or like change system. It's a framework to understand threats and at least to talk about them. We can't handle everything, okay? It's not feasible, but at least we need to understand and we need to prioritize all of the things according to the relevance and what is the data that we're keeping. Because if all of my data is super, super important, then basically I need to protect all of my environment. But if I isolated the relevant information to a certain location and I can like super protect that uh, silo with, uh, I would say reasonable uh, measurements, then basically this will be good enough for now. Maybe with changes, I'll need to change different things. And uh, prioritize the mitigations. We will have ongoing vulnerabilities being discovered. You said node, we're patching, everything is changing. You're getting introduced to new threats also, okay? Because new abilities are like being introduced to the framework and by that, by design, you will introduce new vulnerabilities also. So you need to continuously do the monitoring and checking with the updates and patching. Okay, you have like different kind of methodologies, uh, talking about spoofing, tampering, uh, information disclosure, denial of service, all these things I need to take into account and at least to talk about when I'm trying to design my product. And I'm not even talking about code. Even with the connection with the third parties, when I'm talking with them and I need to kind of understand what am I providing to them? You are talking to different kind of financial services probably, right? Okay, what happens if any of these kind of gets breached? What do you do? Can you actually like, is got a shelter? Can you close the hose? This is a lot of times something that is not possible and you need to think by design of your architecture of how to do that. Okay, so how do you do actually threat modeling and it, doesn't supposed to be like super, super hard, okay? First of all, we need to understand what we're building. What we're creating, we're creating a new component, changing something to create different kind of security landscape. Afterwards, what can go wrong, but I, I, I need to actually like check that out, what will go wrong? Because if we've kind of like identified something that we're building, something probably will like go wrong there. Why? Uh, I am not writing code. As a developer, I'm writing bugs. Okay, because of that, I'm really proud of all of the code that I'm erasing and not writing. And by that, we're introducing what is like security threats. These are security bugs that we're introducing to our infrastructure, right? So we need to know what can actually go wrong. And when we identify what will go wrong, what can we do to actually mitigate that, right? What are we supposed to do about it? And we can actually decide of not doing anything. Okay, this is okay, but again, this is because I identified that this is not important enough. And, of course, after we remediated, kind of verify that, right? Did we do a good enough job? Because if I did some kind of remediation action of removing all of the data that was stolen, how do I check that? That the, the data is not out there, or at least that I'm not still <coughs> exposed with the vulnerability that I found out. A nice question. Of course. Got in the last slide. See? What's the context of threat modeling? It's like 
a, a plan of you know the security revision so every time you add a component when do you need to ask those questions exactly so this really depends on the type of uh, method that you have in your development lifecycle a lot of companies actually do that as part of the CI CD you have in the pipeline a lot of like um, kind of halts in the way like build is breaking because you don't have enough test coverage build is breaking because you have different kind of vulnerabilities introduced to your component so this is another something that by design you've introduced to your process to do threat modeling okay this is automatic threat modeling but when you're designing maybe uh, some kind of integration to a new client okay and you're starting to communicate with him what's the protocol how are you securing yourself etc so different kind of measurements this is actually doing threat modeling okay because why you're introducing a new component to your whole infrastructure all, all of your system for example using a third party not only like using a service again you say how easy is it to actually like include something in your packet in dot json in the, in node right but uh, what kind of by by the way you said you mentioned that you're scanning all of the interdependencies all the field, field is checked. yes uh, how you're doing that npm audit. npm audit okay there are like different kind of things also to do auditing on your open source tools snick and uh, check marks and all of these like static code analysis things you can do that by design right but again you a lot of times you're introducing things that you don't know how they work actually Okay, so you need to kind of like break down their architecture to understand if it imposes risk on you. So this is part of the design. You can actually, if, if you have some kind of like, um, you're working agile, I presume so. You have sprints, right? Or you're working uh, sprints. sprints. Okay, so you have sprint planning. You're talking about the features that you're introducing and what components you need to touch, right? This is part of the architecture. What about security? Just add another clause there talking about security, at least talking about it, okay? Trying to see if you need to take that more into depth or you can basically move forward because this is part of your own security mechanism already in place. So these are the phases that you can actually introduce. And of course, once we've created the life cycle of development in general, you need to do threat modeling on your production environment also. So this is out of the development life cycle, you have the operational side also. And how do you actually like protect your data because this is already not your code, your customer data also, right? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so after talking about like 45 minutes, I'll talk a bit about what we're doing at Panrays, okay? And I will show you an example, a live example of Zeus. Um, so uh, mapping the world cyber posture, but bottom line, we're helping companies, large enterprises, SMBs, and even small companies to manage the cybersecurity risk that is imposed by their supply chain, by the suppliers, by the vendors and third parties. And we have a lot of customers also doing that with their own business partners, okay? Because like I mentioned, a lot of times you have a company, okay? That holds subsidiary companies. They have a CISO and the CISO doesn't have access to the subsidiary companies. They have their own CISO. So he's also looking at them as third parties, third party entities that he needs to do auditing on top of them. A lot of times, like Elad had mentioned, uh, people like to take, for example, the target breach. Have you heard of it? Have, do you know target? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. A good start. Okay. One of the biggest retailers in the U.S. Target, around like five years ago, were breached by their AC company, air conditioning company. Okay. Uh, they got hacked because, of course, they didn't want to go directly to target. They stole their credentials to target, and they stole all of, all of their customer data. And until now, they have the astonishing number of up to, I think, more than $500 million that Target are paying uh, in compensation to all of the customers that were hit by the, uh, the hack. Okay, so this is amazing. And you can have a lot of, like, more examples like uh, Sony, T-Mobile, Lockheed Martin. We've talked about Equifax and all of these companies that were breached. Equifax was the third party that got breached and hit all of the big companies that actually use them as a service. Okay, and us as, okay, I don't have a social security number, but all of the American and Canadians that were hit there. But it's not only your IT vendors, okay? And this is the real important thing to keep in mind. Financial platforms, hello, mm -hmm. okay? And a lot of times you have payroll services, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Hilan, Malam Sahar, and all of these like places that basically hold of all of our records of all of our uh, paychecks. Law firms, all of our most valuable like agreements that we have, accounting companies. Uh -huh. Okay, have you heard of the Panama breach? 
a law firm in Panama that a lot of like fishy things kept were kept there and they got breached and all of the most secret documents of uh, dark uh, entities got out okay uh, and uh, one of the funniest stories is one of our customers actually a large bank told us to vet his flower delivery company and we were like why is it important at all and they said that they have the list of all of their high ranking employees all of their most valuable customers with their names addresses phone numbers and birth dates in which you actually assemble passwords out of Okay, so every supplier can actually be substantial to our business according to what we need. Because if if it's a problem for me to somebody uh, for somebody to know all of my suppliers basically, then even my flower delivery company can be dangerous. Somebody told me about like his candy shop in Iowa that is important also. So how do we do that? Basically, we look at the company in the hacker's point of view. We look at it from the outside without installing anything. So we look at the IT network, all of the lower level infrastructure things, SSL certificates, botnets, um, uh, domains, IP addresses, all of the you know layer three and below. Um, application layer, all of it is out facing to the customer, mail servers, web servers, domain targeted attacks. You know what that is? When you create a permutation of the domain and launch a phishing website. Yeah. Okay, so for example, 10 bis and 10 is. Okay, and it might look similar, and basically you do uh, input your credentials, and that's it. Yes, with an uh, with a one, and I can show you different kind of things. Uh, did you know that uh, UTF-8 is a legitimate domain name? Like you can assemble legitimate things from UTF-8, and you know that an acrylic K looks exactly the same as a regular K. For example, okay. And you won't even notice that. Again, I, I also got the, like um, British Airways kind of advertising uh, free wow. tickets. How many of you have gotten this? And it looks the same, BritishAirways.com, but with small dots underneath the letters because this is something that is also possible with, UT, with UTF-8. And I got it via WhatsApp. And it, you need to re look really, really close to actually not notice that. And of course, what I defined at the beginning, the stupid factor employees of the company, okay? Uh, more than actually like 50 or 60% of hacks are being done through phishing emails, through employees being targeted, etc. And again, how do we do that? We're creating a 360 perimeter overview on the company. Basically with pen raise, with a click of a button, you can create full transparency on all of your supply chain by adding your suppliers to the management platform and creating online auditing for 24 seven monitoring on your suppliers. And of course, everything is being done installation free because otherwise it's pretty like unscalable. Okay. And we don't install anything, not in the part of our customer auditing his suppliers and not in the part of the supplier. So under the hood, basically we're kind of like taking the first phase of the life cycle of the hacker called reconnaissance when he actually creates the attack surface of any of his targets. And for example, one of the types is, I want to understand the landscape of the web server of any company, of some domain that I'm actually accessing. So this is one behavior. Multiply that by a lot of behaviors of collecting data. We're assembling that with uh, our platform. Creating that combination with the smart questionnaires. Today, everybody are handling that with manual questionnaires, sending Excel spreadsheets, uh, DevOps guys, how many uh, questionnaires like that have you gotten? Or none, oh, because the founders got that? Fun for you. Okay, this is basically 60 to 360 questions. The most awful one was like 860 something questions that a bank had sent, asking if you have security policies in place, if you have multi-factor authentication, if you're doing background checks on employees, where are you hosted, how you're securing your physical data center, etc. and a lot of irrelevant questions. So we're combining that according to the relationship. Uh, we're sending the relevant questions to the suppliers, combining everything in a data lake to create the like assembly of all of that data. And by that, creating two things out of the platform, personalized ratings and also actionable insights. Okay. And by that, basically we're creating according to the relationship with the supplier, the relevant projection mm -hmm. of how it looks in the matter of cybersecurity for me. But it's not only saying, the most important thing is not only saying to the supplier, you're good or bad, okay? Your security posture is crap. It's actually providing means and measurements for him to actually improve himself. 
and telling him how he looks from the outside as a hacker to the hacker and how to improve himself and prioritize that, of course, because we talked about threat modeling, right? And because of that, we need to kind of prioritize the relevant things that impose risk to us. We've shortened the life cycle, I won't go into depth here into process and everything, from a couple of months that it took to actually audit suppliers to up to 72 hours, because this is the SLA that we're providing our customers of evaluating a company. Why am I saying up to? Because if the attack surface is not too large, basically we can assess even a company in a couple of hours. So it really depends on the amount of assets that I'm scanning and the way and the, according to the relationship that I have with the supplier. Okay, so demo. Uh, I won't say show a live demo, but uh, Zeus is a part of Panerais also, okay? Because uh, one of our customers, Pioneer, is your customer also. And they've done auditing on you guys. Uh, said Yael got it probably right. She's the point of contact there. This is from what I remember. And this is your security posture when you're looking from the outside because you can see here, uh, this is like, I, I don't know where I took it from, but basically this is without any relationship levels that we're providing right now and only auditing GDPR. So if we had put in other relationship types, we would have scanned you differently and actually rated you differently also because this really depends on how it's interconnected with you. Why? For example, we can have two banks working with Tenvis. One bank is only calling them by phone and actually ordering things, and the other has a mobile app, has some kind of interconnected API, and also accessing the website. So we can't look at, at like from both sides on the supplier in the same way. And you can see like uh, how many assets we found. I think we inputted a lot. You remember? We inputted only Zeus.com, right? Yes, so basically we found, uh, you can see like 176 assets, which means uh, domains, subdomains, and IP addresses that are exposed to the world. And a lot of times we're getting from customers, uh, I think the most common question is, or, or actually like statement, oh, I didn't remember that this was out, okay? Like integration environments, development environments that are exposed, some things that are not supposed to be really open to the outer world, okay? For example, I saw one big customer, an IPO company, a really large company, that I like surfed to their website, and I saw, first of all, an unsecure website with an expired SSL certificate I went in. I saw a login credential to their own internal system. I, I can see the logo, okay, this was them. And uh, underneath there was like a really red, really big red sign saying, from this date and on, three months ago, this will be connected to the production database. Please do not input any integration or development uh, credentials because this will automatically log in. And a dump of IP addresses. I'm guessing if I had put in admin, admin, or like admin one to six, probably I would have gotten it. Okay? If you're familiar with Google hacking, you can find like Trello, public Trello with passwords and stuff like that, bloating companies. Yeah, you would be surprised. Amazing stuff. And also, you can see like some of the assets that we've talked about, the zoos. Everything is exposed to the world. This is like public information that people like, can actually gather. And how many findings we found on each one of them, and if they are active or not right now, because we're doing a continuous scanning. Mm -hmm. uh, like one more. See. What is the cluster? What is the model? Ah. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry, UX-wise it's crap. Uh, green means it's okay. Yeah, but you don't use MongoDB. Be because of that, so you don't, okay. you're not exposed to that. <laughs> <laughs> the MongoDB thing is basically, it's, it's shaming that had been done to Mongo. I'm sorry, I have to say. Because Mongo was not breached, okay? Stupid people configured things stupidly. And they actually got uh, left uh, like open ports of, you know, like the 27001 open to the world. And by that, you could connect to the database. And by default, how Mongo comes? Unauthenticated, right? So you can basically take all of the data, do crypto, uh, cryptographic uh, ransomware on that, and of course, give me ransomware right now. That's what people mostly did. And you can see like different kinds of mitigations, okay? Like some certificates, you can check that out afterwards. By the way, I can show you if you'd like. Uh, some certificates that are out there that are uh, not strong enough, uh, untrusted certificates to different kind of subdomains that you have. A lot of times customers, they join from the side of the supplier also. So once they join from the side of the supplier, they can improve themselves and they enter more assets that we couldn't find 
wouldn't correlate. They're trying to hide, but they want to scan. So by that, we're providing measurements for them to actually input more data to the platform for the, for the platform to discover more assets and to create more vulnerabilities or like at least to identify them for the person to actually know that. And of course, because we're scanning that continuously, if you had closed something, we can actually see that and we will improve your security posture. We had a lot of suppliers joining the platform invited by our uh, uh, customers that they saw all of these vulnerabilities tried to close all of these things and basically improve their secure posture over time. Okay, for example, you're using Node probably, uh, some kind of load balancing, Nginx probably or something, right? Yeah. What? Yeah. Okay, so by that, a lot of times you have one backend serving a lot of subdomains, right? The same one. Uh, no, it's not the no, no, you have a lot of customers that do that. Okay, a lot of companies that do that. They have a one uh, backend entry uh, with a load balancer that is serving that. But when you want to upgrade something, you basically upgrade your server with one version that you're stating to an, an NPM or whatever. And basically by that, you know, like uh, helmet, you know that? Uh, creating like uh, some kind of overlay over your HTTP re requests and uh, you can add like um, additional security headers etc okay this is a tool and by adding helmet you can improve like uh, at least close a lot of tasks automatically because all of your HTTP requests are being handled and added with headers like uh, security headers but you fixed it only in one place and fixed like 300 findings because a lot, again, these are like exposure methods that you have to hackers. Okay, so summary and conclusion to this part. <laughs> I'll try to go faster to the other part. Um, and we'll have a, a short recess also because I think you're tired. Um, we've talked about threat modeling. It's great, but it's not enough because we did some kind of thinking, we created some kind of infrastructure, and that's it. If we've finished like at this point, basically we don't have anything continuous being followed, right? So by that, what's like an axiom in the world of software development? That everything is changing all of the time. This is the only thing that is certain. And by that, we need to also like continuously monitor everything. Developers also should threat model, and not only security people. So by saying, okay, but we don't have security experts in the company, let's try to find these expertise. A lot of things are out of the box, and we can actually provide that to our product and talk about security because you're smart people. Okay, try to leverage that. Uh, prioritize all of your data. Like we're prioritizing pro um, product features and everything, let's prioritize all of the risks that we have. Um, make it quick make it lightweight and make it agile. Because again, what we are is lazy people, okay? And because everything that is hard, basically we won't get to it and we won't do that. So we need to do that. And security is a process, it's not a one-off. Of course, always challenge yourself. Always try to tackle what's going on in production, what's going on in the development process, and how we can actually improve that in the world of cybersecurity also, and not only in the world of performance in software engineering. Okay, after I talked a lot, Okay, and really, really fast probably. Do you have any questions? Okay, how much time do you want to have recess and continue on to the Kubernetes talk? Or I, I can keep talking. It's up to you. <laughs> it's having a recess or going earlier? Ten dollars. Ten dollars, okay, move forward, awesome. Okay, so.